is one of uh, this is one of those poems about music, directly about music and its subject matter. The day is foul, a thin sleet falling everywhere, the slops of it congealing on the street with trash, soot, smog, and general grime. The sky's dark clouds incarnate underfoot. Buses, cars, people, rats, roaches flooding the street with their effluvia. Inside the studio, it's high summer, 18th century rational Germany. On the open score, a meadow blooms, the notes flowers on their upright stems, the pianist harvesting from each its grain of sound. She has, that is, the undeflected focus of a bee, and from the concert grand, the fugue emerging. See how it seduces what carries no mark of the present world, no news, no merchants, no murderous weather, no crude alarms, no lives lost or saved. A great number of people who came here to be discovered, to be found. There were also a number who came on vacation to watch. Um, those two groups, I think, are pretty much gone. I think most people come for the serious conversation about uh, writing and come to have their work looked at and responded to. And um, the people on the faculty are serious about teaching. Breadloaf has always been the largest and the best known writers conference. Uh, it was also the first. I think Robert Frost's uh, gifts to this place are, uh, are just legion, and, and especially in the notion of how important just conversation was to him. He liked to think of himself at Breadloaf as being a sort of professor of conversation. Um, the, uh, the publicity people would uh, do their brochures for Middlebury, in which he would be called the godfather of Breadloaf. Frost uh, was, was just well known. He would be up in his um, cabin writing for most of the day. Late in the afternoon, he would come down and begin to receive visitors and go up to Breadloaf uh, for dinner and, uh, and for conversation late into the night. Robert Frost stood here and understood that this was a magical world that he could write from, a place where he could talk about universal things. He saw, heard the sound of the wind in the trees, and he wrote his wonderful poem, The Sound of Trees. He looked and he'd see in the winter a beautifully snowy landscape, and he could extrapolate from that landscape and see this as somehow an image of the human condition. Robert Frost could look, look into the woods deeply, and he didn't just see trees, but he saw nature as a symbol of the spirit. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth, then took the other as just as fair, though as for that, the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, and leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever turn back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the road less traveled by, and that has made all the difference.
uh, when Frost saw bread loaf in the campus here, he thought this might be a new way of educating people. This might be a way of eliciting uh, some creative response, that people can respond to the landscape, to the beautiful setting, and ideally they should respond to poets and fiction writers, writers talking about writing. You would think of Breadloaf in the 1920s with Vermont's bad roads at the time, at the, the difficulty of getting around, that this might have been a purely regional kind of adult education course that took place during the, the summer weeks in, in August. But oddly enough, uh, it attracted from the very beginning people from as far away as New York City, Washington, D.C., Chicago, um, many places in the Midwest. Um, it combined two perfect things. I mean, it combined a pristine setting up in the Green Mountains, and it was a new thing where writers could get together and talk about their art. This has been a special mountain for me, a place of surprises, a place of discovery, a place where I don't know what's going to happen next, a place of magic. I remember the first time I came to Breadloaf, summer 1969, a young girl, 19 years old. I was blown away. People who loved stories and poems as much as I did. It's a very lonely craft. You know, you are at that writing table, you are in solitude, you are, uh, you know, alone with these characters and, and this world that's in your head, but you are alone. And it's so wonderful to come to a place like Breadloaf where you can talk to other people who are also engaged in that process and share with them, you know, some of what goes on when you're doing that writing. And so I think part of what you feel here is the energy of people who are, are suddenly, you know, found other uh, compañeros in this craft uh, that they've been at alone with intensity to share the process with. <laughs> the larger focus for the conference is on the work itself, uh, what it means to struggle to be a writer uh, in America in, in the 21st century. We come up here to the mountain for 11 days. We live communally. We talk frantically about what it means to be a writer. And that gives us courage to go home and face the blank page, the uh, dirty computer screen, whatever implement that, that we use as, as a writer. The life of a writer is uh, solitary. My wife keeps telling me that. Um, it's long hours, and it's it's uh, it's continual. Uh, you have to write every day, uh, even if even if you're not writing. In my case, poetry. It's, it has to be prose. It has to be letters. Uh, it has to be essays. It's not just a matter of, of of writing. It's a matter of revising, and revising, and revising. Um, I have in my own work. I, I might revise a poem 50 times. You've got to keep plodding along, as it were, working day after day after day. And you've got to do it almost with a kind of, for me, if I can use the metaphor, uh, a kind of uh, a, a keeping of the hours, a religious keeping of the hours. It has to be that serious, because it, it is a calling. It is a vocation, I think. Uh, or at least I prefer it, or I see it that way. And it means uh, you keep writing until the day you die. You do a lot of um, identifying and taking apart and and le leaving things out and reconnecting and redrafting. I, I told the students today that I sometimes spend years just writing and not w knowing what I'm doing, you know, letting my jottings go. And then a, a while later, I, I see a pattern in it. This is an early poem of mine. It's about waiting for my father coming home from work on the swing shift. It's called Off from Swing Shift. Late, just past midnight, Freeway noise from the harbor and San Diego leaking in from the vent over the stove. And he's off from swing shift at Lear's. 
eight hours of twisting circuitry, charting ohms and maximum gains while transformers hum and helicopters swirl on the roofs above the small factory. He hails me with a head fake, then the bob and weave of a weekend middleweight learned at the Y on Kapiolani ten years before I was born. Then the easy grin saying, he's lucky as they come. Lucky come Hawaii. I think poetry is uh, primal in many ways when it's when it re really working well. Um, we say things because of a rhythm that we prefer. It helps us say things. It's not so much what we say, but how we say it, to paraphrase Robert Frost. It's like in the poetry reading last evening by Yusef Komanyaka, he talks about a man building a drum. And there's, a, there's three lines of the poem, four lines of the poem, and they're, these are the lines. Kadoom, doom, doom, doom. Kadoom, doom, doom. Kadoom, doom, doom, doom. Kadoom. It has, he's talking about the rhythm. He's talking about how the accents fall, how the emphasis is structured, and how they create a pattern. Kadoom. 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 Now. I've beaten a song back into you. Rise and walk away like a panther. The body is an instrument for the voice. It's all part of the same. Cosmos, modern man in a pepper pot. You got to get hooked into every hungry groove. So deep the bomb, locked in rust, opens like a fist. Into it, into it. So deep rhythm is pre-memory. The need got to be basic animal need to see and know the terror we are made of, honey. Because if you want to dance this boogie, be ready to let the devil use your head for a drum. I think of poetry as being open-ended. So it invites the reader or the listener in as co-creative meaning. If you can see blues in the ocean, light and dark, can feel worms ease through a subterranean path beneath each footstep, baby, you got rhythm. For me, um, poetry is, is not, not, not so much um, a composite of answers, as much as a process of discovery. I love my big hands. I love it clear down to the soft, quick motor of each breath. The liver's ten kinds of desire. The kidneys lust for sugar. The scan, the suck of dong, enjoy this spleen floating like a compass needle inside nighttime, always divining West Africa's dusty horizon. I love the birthmark. Posed like a fighting cock on my right shoulder blade. I love this body, this solo, ragtime jubilee behind the left nipple because I know I was born to wear out at least 100 angels. I read aloud my own work all the time in the, in the middle of constructing it because those things that are not apparent on the page become apparent to the ear. I think that the the short story, you know, bears a, a resemblance more to the poem as a form, more of a resemblance than than the novel would, precisely because of the 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 interest in the line and um, the briefness of the endeavor and the fact that it can be held in the in the mind in a single reading or a single sitting. And so sound becomes ever more important, probably, for me anyway, in, in constructing the short story. I get up at 2 or 3 in the morning, not, not on purpose, but that it happens to be the time I can feel alone. Um, and I don't, I don't mean alone as in just uh, by myself, but that the world is not going to impinge on me either. There's no one who's going to phone me in the middle of the night, and there's no mail to answer or arrive, and there's no body knocking on the door, and moreover, my concerns, my concerns for my kids or for my students or for whomever are put to bed. Literally, those, those people are asleep and safe. And so then 
I have the, the absolute privacy of my engagement with my computer screen, which is the only light source in the house at that moment. And the only thing on that screen is what I'm thinking. And so it's not just that I'm alone, but that whatever is, is going on to the computer screen is not to be seen by anybody or known by anybody until I'm ready to make it known. To write has always meant more to me than almost anything else. Obviously, fiction is pretty primary. Not only do I escape into it, but it informs me about the world in a way that I really had not thought. I mean, if I think of the way I saw the world before I read Gabriel Garcia's Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude, and the way I looked at it after I'd read it, I mean, every book you read, every story you read, informs, changes, colors, shifts. And there's always that one book, that one author, who really can change the way you look at so much. It's idyllic in many ways, it really is. If, if your thing is being around writers, um, talking, writing ad nauseum, it really is extraordinary. I like what a workshop does, it, it's a mutually beneficial activity. You work on other people's stories, they work on your stories. The class reads a student's work in advance, and then we sit around and we talk about it uh, with constructive comments. They're juice, they're jazz, they're jamming. They, uh, it's, they, they seem to know exactly what they got themselves in for and are you know, swimming 24-7. <laughs> they really are enjoying it. You, you, you get up at, at the wee hours and, and you go to bed in the wee hours. I don't think I've had more than four or five hours of sleep a, a night. It's so jam-packed. One hour you're writing high because you're listening to the lecture. And then you go into your critique and you're falling down like, you know, down to Hades. Um, and then another hour, you're up again, and it's just continuous, continuous stuff. And you're meeting other writers, and they're aspiring whichever way they're going. And so it, it's like up and down, up and down, up and down. And even I, you know, hardened news reporter that I am, am still very vulnerable in a sense when it comes to creative writing. Being here reminds me uh I think of, of uh, some of the compromises that I make being a journalist. Uh, uh, being a journalist is a, is a quite practical thing. I used to be a freelance writer and uh, lead a sort of hand-to-mouth existence. Uh, maybe it would be more apt to say that being here makes, reminds me of the writer that I would like to be. Everybody has dropped a lot to come up here for 12 days. That's a, a long time to put your life on hold, wh whatever it is. And most people have had to take some kind of a spiritual machete out and chop their way through their own jungle to get up here. The conference is the chance for this, the conferee, the writer, to be with the workshop leader alone and to run the show. We look into each other's eyes uh, for half hour, 45 minutes, and nobody else is interrupting, and they, they just can have that. And it, it makes a bond that actually lasts beyond the conference. Sometimes, of course, writers worry that they have no place at all. A great deal of talk about being nobody nowhere, the wallflower at the culture, you know, that, that uh, the movies are doing it all, or pop music is doing it all. And so there is a sense, I think, about writing, about the written word, and about the genres that gather here, fiction, poetry, and nonfiction uh, of various sorts, that we belong to older and, in some ways, less glitzy traditions. It seems to be one of the rarefied pleasures, for me anyway, of being at Fred Love is to terrify myself by standing up here and reading the latest thing that I have written. Well, sometimes I think writers are guinea pigs or present themselves as guinea pigs for the culture. We say things, do things,
create stories that illustrate or in some way um, show things that are happening in the culture. And in so doing, we kind of hold up a mirror and we say, that this is what's happening. In Inuktitut, uh, Inuit language, Eastern Canadian Arctic, the word for storyteller is isumtak. It means the person who creates the atmosphere in which wisdom reveals itself. I think there's a popular notion that when you hear a story, you, you learn something. I don't think that's what happens. I think what happens in a story is that you're reminded again of something you already know. Maybe you know it in your body, or maybe you know it in your emotions without language, or maybe you know it in your mind. But the story reminds you of something that you forgot. And when you remember it, you feel exhilarated. For me, I, I love that moment of working with an audience, of watching faces and hearing language come off a page and back through that auditory part of my mind that I use when I write to bring it back and put it out in an audience. We have a, a beautiful enterprise with our stories and our poems and our beautiful mother tongue. And it is something like a gift of the gods that we get to come together like this. From my point of view, storytelling is a social impulse. And the social impulse is to take care of your people. Part of the reason I'm at Breadloaf is to help the people who have chosen to come into a classroom where I am, help them find that way to take what they know and make it into something that will help all of us. There's shipwreck in life from one end to the other. I think every person, probably by the time they're 30 years old, has been driven to their knees. They've been alone in some room on their knees, weeping, wondering, who cares if I die? Why should I bother to get up? Why should I go out the door? Why should I go to work? Why should I write a reform this relationship with this woman or this man? Why should I try for custody for my kids? They're on their knees, and they would just as soon die. They need a story, and the story that they need is a story that they can believe about the purpose of life, and that's the place I want to be in. I knew nothing of Bogota, but I felt the author had captured its essence. My view was that Onesimo Peña had not written a travel book, but a work about the soul of Bogota. There has been no great poet in the history of poetry who has not also been a great reader of poetry. One of the deep impulses in writing poetry is to express yourself and your own feelings, your demons, to transfigure yourself into, into something. But another equally important impulse, maybe more important, is at some point you read something so beautiful that you wish you had made it, and that something has affected you so greatly that you want to respond in kind. And I suggest that people who want to respond in kind become poets. Sometimes people talk to me about poetry and they say it must be nice to have such a cerebral occupation. And I look at them dumbfounded because it doesn't strike me as cerebral in any way. Everything seems at stake in it for me. Everything's invested. And so it's not as if you're you know, sitting on lawn chairs leaning back saying, oh, what can I think about the summer afternoon? You're you know, deeply engaged with your own emotional life, with your own demons, your own experiences, and you're trying to transfigure them into, into a made thing, into art. Remember how the city looked from the harbor in early evening? Its brutal gaze averted, its poised and certain countenance wavering with lights. Remember how we sat in sway back chairs and marveled at the brush fires of dust clear in the distance. 
The flames scrawled across the skyline like a signature while current shifted inside us. Ecstasy of fireworks rising in midsummer, of fulvous sails flashing in the heat and orange life buoys bobbing on the water. Ecstasy of flares and secrets and two bodies held aloft by desire. Judge us as you will, but remember that we too lived once in the fullness of a moment before the darkness took its turn with us and the night clamped shut. I'm teaching poetry, I'm suggesting that you are not just as a young poet connecting to the people around you, the people at Breadloaf, the people in your workshop, wherever you are, you are joining a very great and noble enterprise that is worldwide. Mm -hmm.